The Bible says a lot about gossip and how destructive it can be, but yet we're also commanded to speak. So how can we know when we're gossiping? Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Seitz. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. God's very clear. On the one hand, words can have very destructive consequences, that they can be used to destroy, to damage. And on the other hand, we're commanded to expose the hidden works of darkness, which, which requires words, and we're not supposed to, to cover up things. So how can we tell when we're gossiping versus when we're using words the way that we should be? I mean, I think it's even interesting. One of the reasons why this is difficult and complex is partly because the church has forgotten what the purpose of the church is. I mean, when, when you go, when you're in like a workplace, you kind of can understand that, you know, there's like in the military and things like that, there's like the need to know basis about things. There's a, there's a purpose for knowledge. There's a purpose for information transfer. It's true at work as well. And there's even a part of it where work kind of has standard standing around the water cooler and gossiping, and we kind of recognize what gossiping is and has a structure. But the church has become this place where we don't think of it as really having much more of a purpose than just sort of a social aspect. Whereas God created the church actually to be the center of industry and the center of, I mean, it's, it's, it's supposed to be about the work for the kingdom. It's supposed to be about doing what God wants done in the world. And there's this part of it where because we've lost that idea, we've kind of lost how, what, what our words are supposed to be for. When we talk about exhorting one another, we've kind of, we kind of think that means just making each other feel good as opposed to, no, it's actually encouraging people, putting courage in them. It's, it's like you said, exposing works of darkness. It's, it's very specific things that God has commanded us to do that frame the way we think about our words. And that's very much what defines the difference between gossip and trying to do God's will and speaking to someone because it really matters both what your intent is and your understanding of what you're actually accomplishing. And when we think of other other things, right, like business where you're actually going and you're you're doing something. Yeah, some people just work with words, but a lot of people work with hammers and they work with, you know, a gun if you're a soldier and they work with physical things. But the church's point is to work with words. Right. We're given the word of God. We're supposed to be wielding the sword of the word. I mean, the church is focused and built around the word, and the word that we're the work that we're supposed to do is based on the word. So, how we handle the word and knowing how to handle the word correctly is really important for the church and a really necessary thing for the church, more so in some than some of these other ones, because the church is based on the word. And just to double down on the complexity and the difficulty of dealing with this, when you start talking about the concept of gossip. It's really clear. There's Bible verses about it. God says things about it. God says, don't do anything about it. But then we live in a culture where gossiping is a virtue. It's a fun pastime. Let's all gossip. And there's there's almost no social restraint on one's desire to gossip or ability to gossip. And the internet has only exploded that even more. So you've got... All as long as you're not caught, there's a constraint if you're caught by the person who you're gossiping against. It, it depends <laughs> sometimes, but the social cost for it is very low right. in most cases. Right. There's nothing outside the church where we can sort of lean against and say, oh, okay, well, there's if, if we gossip, there's going to be some kind of consequences. It's all got to be coming from the church, and the church has been pretty weak in just upholding the word of God on this particular thing. So we don't even really know what gossip is. And if we don't really know what gossip is, if, if, if gossip is just one of those things, oh, well, I kind of define it based on what I've, I know when I see it sort of way, then, then we don't really have anything we can lean into where we can say, here are the bounds of gossip. And here are cases where I know I'm gossiping and here are cases where actually what I'm doing is I'm exposing a secret thing that needs to be exposed. We don't really know what the distinction is between those other than in this circumstance, it just feels like the right thing for me to do. And it becomes kind of an arbitrary thing where someone does something that, you know, makes you uncomfortable or hurts you, then it's gossip. Or, But if it's you're doing something, then you feel it's always appropriate and you don't have any actual standards to critique your own actions. It's just all gut instinct. And it turns out what you're doing is what your gut instinct tells you to do. And God, you know, really gives warnings about this in James 3, 5 through 11. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. 
And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? And, and I do think, you know, the picture of fire that's being used there, you know, fire, we all know how destructive fire can be, but also fire does a lot of good things. And it's kind of the same way. If it's used properly, it is very beneficial. And when it's used improperly, it's incredibly destructive. And I think the church kind of, like you say, I mean, that the kind of the opinion of the church is, well, I'll just feel my way. Well, people don't do that when they're walking out in the forest as they go, oh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just make a fire here. Where if they're camping there, they might make a fire there, but they'll also clear the brush around it so that they make sure a spark doesn't go out. They might dig around it. They might get a bucket of water to make sure that they, they do things to protect it because they go, you know, a spark from this fire could cause real destruction. But we don't think in the church of the words the same way. And James is writing and saying, that's how you should think about it. That's how destructive it is. It can destroy whole things. It can it goes one to another. It starts jumping. It spreads. It, and it causes real destruction. But at the same time, life would be really hard without fire. And I mean, I think, I think that's a really, it's a really good example because when you talk about starting a fire, like all the things you do to start a fire, it's, you treat it as if it's something that's potentially dangerous. You put it in a context, you know, like you said, you, you create a fire pit, whether it's that you've dug out with dirt or whether you've lined it with bricks or you've, you know, you bring rocks down and you do these things because in the end, you think of this as a potentially dangerous thing. And you look at people who are careful with their words and they frequently, they, they frame them. They try to put them in a context. They try to, you know I mean? They try to mm -hmm. put them in a setting where they recognize there's going to be things where they're going to be inaccurate. And so they want to structure things in a way so that the damage caused by that inaccuracy is limited. And I think the church is really, and this is really significant because I think the church has lost the idea of the power of words. So they don't worry much about gossip because they don't think words are that powerful. But think about it. That's why you preach sermons. That's why every church has sermons that would be called a church. It's because the belief is that the words are powerful, but then they turn around, they don't think individually words are powerful. And that's a really, right, the, and when you think of like Daniel 2, where there's a stone that's cut without hands that will destroy all the kingdoms of the earth, well, it, that destruction happens without hands. That, that destruction happens so that all the kingdoms of the earth are to be brought down by words. And yet we think we don't really need to think about the words that we say because words aren't that powerful. It really rejects the whole structure of the church, what the church is supposed to do on this world, when you say words don't matter that much, they aren't that powerful. Because words are powerful, there is also the part that God actually holds us accountable for the words that we speak. Matthew 12, 36 to 37 says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. I mean, I don't know if you felt it, but I mean, reading it, I, it, it, it should make you a little bit nervous when you read a verse like that. It should make you think carefully about the words that you say because you will stand before God and you will give an account for every idle word. And I am a person who tends to talk a lot. In Proverbs, it even says, you know, in the multitude of words, there's much sin. It's very easy to, to treat words as if they don't matter. And hey, I speak a lot of words. I, you know, I'm not like inherently talkative, but I go and do lots of conferences and I speak a lot in front of a lot of people. And, you know, that's a scary thought when you think all those words will be brought into judgment. So it means that you really have an obligation to be careful with your words. But I don't think the church thinks that it needs to be careful with its words. But Jesus Christ is called the Word of God for a reason. It's because of the significance of words and and the significance of the words that he gave to us and the words that we're supposed to give to other people. And so when we think about it and we just go, ah, yeah, let's just flippantly say whatever we want, you know, because there's no social burden to it. Even in the church, there's usually no social burden to it. 
then we should just recognize that that doesn't mean God isn't sitting there judging. <clears throat> and this is something where Proverbs you know, also warns that uh, words can be, can be very powerful, can be something that uh, you, need, you need to be careful of. Uh, Proverbs 18, verse 8, The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles, and they go down into the inmost body. And so these words that are, you know, not something that you should be receiving, yet they are so tasty that we have a natural inclination to want to seize on them and take them within us. And when you're being that gossip where you're actually trying to get people to listen to you, which is what gossips do, right? I mean, it's no fun gossiping when you're talking to yourself because you're passing along information you already know. <laughs> so you're trying to get other people to listen is the whole goal. And when they hear, it really affects them. It really changes them, right? I mean, that's the point of it. It's They're like a tasty trifle. It goes down to the inmost part of the body. And so we. it's very easy to just think, oh, yeah, I'm saying these things, and I get these people to listen to me, and I, you know, and, you know, I like that. I like the fact that I have more power over them and everything else because they look up to me because I know things that they don't know and all the reasons that people gossip. And it's easy to forget that you're actually doing real damage and you're really changing the person that you're talking to because it go, does go and they may not even think about it again, but then sometime they'll be talking to the person that you were gossiping about and they'll remember it and it will bring up and they'll change their attitude towards that person. And we think that we're not affecting people, but we're really affecting people. And just something to note about this verse it doesn't say anything about the truth or falsity of what the talebearer is saying. Right. This isn't. It, it is not a necessary feature that this talebearer is bringing lies. Right. It doesn't say the slander, or the words of a slander, or right. tasty trifles. Right. They could be telling you something that's absolutely true, and it's something you have no business listening to. And there's a part of it where I mean, understand. I mean, it's actually identifying a, the one who bears tales in this verse is not painted in a positive light. Right. So, I mean, and there are people who that's their role in certain groups is to be the one who they bear tales. And so you don't want to be that. You don't want to be the person who, when something happens, always is the person who communicates it throughout the group. Yeah, ask them. They'll definitely know what's going on. Right. I mean, and like I said, I mean, there, and we'll talk about this as we go through. There is information that people should know about, and that's generally disseminated in specific ways. It's usually, I mean, and it's generally carried out in certain ways, but the person who listens to everything, tells everybody things, tells people secrets, tells things that they have no business telling about, being the person who goes around bearing information that people can't get through other channels, that's not generally something that you want to be. And there, there's a difference between going, oh, go ask him. He's the boss. He's in charge. He'll know. Right. Versus go and ask that person because he'll know. He always knows, right? right. The one's a tail bearer and the other one's fulfilling their responsibility potentially. I mean, they could also be a tail bearer. But, but when you think of somebody and there's – it's frequent in groups that there's somebody like, oh, they'll know what's going on. Well, that's because they like to bear tails. And sometimes even it's – it's not the person who you can go ask about it, but it's the person who tells you and you didn't have to ask. Because sometimes, Absolutely. You know, sometimes, That's why they get the reputation. Right. Because you know? you know, sometimes someone is more friendly, they have more connections, so they're the one who, if you need to know something, they know it. But they're not always the person who's going and telling you everything they found out. If they are, that is a new level of dangerous. I mean, one of the other things you'll see throughout this, I think as we talk about this, is, is it does also – there can be fine lines and things, right? I mean, there can be, if, if you're giving people actual information and this is information that the other person needs for a specific reason, that can be very different. And so, I mean, there can be people who have, we're not saying that fundamentally someone who is a journalist is always a gossip, but there are plenty of journalists who are gossips. Well, and, there's gossip columnists. Right. Columnists, but I mean, but even, gossip, beyond, so. even beyond just the gossip columnists, right? I mean, there are people who their goal is to, spread information around that they really don't know enough about. They don't know how, I mean, and so as we talk about this, there are specific distinctives that separate some of these things. And so, I mean, it's just, it's very important to recognize you can't just go, you told me information, you're gossiping. Right, that, because it's, it's definitely more complicated and, than that. And if you're in the position where you have information and you're wondering, oh, am I this kind of person? 
it's actually really hard to self-diagnose. It's really hard to check your motives and say. So you should go and tell everybody what you have and say, should I talk to people? About this? I was gonna say you should go check out what the Bible has to say and start there. You know, maybe go to James chapter one verse twenty six. Maybe that'd be a better place first. But we could try that. James one twenty six. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So it can be really hard to tell if, if you're that Proverbs tail bearer, it can be hard for you to tell yourself the truth about yourself when you have this information you just want to give out because you know there's an audience for it. You know that they're going to find what you have to say tasty and thereby accumulate friends and followers. You'll get attention. Whatever it is that you're craving, you're in a position now that you can get it. James is telling you, here's a way to check yourself. Here's a way to see if you're that person or if you're actually giving information that's edifying. It's, you know, just ask, are you bridling your tongue? Do you have some kind of rein on what you say and when you say it and to whom you say it and in what context you say it? If you don't have that, then he's saying you're not a Christian. And this is, this is central to religion. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, like you say, you know what I mean? Like if your religion doesn't accomplish this, if this is not what your religion does, I mean, and, and that religion is supposed to have a use. I mean, I mean, some of these things are like fundamental things that have become, you know, right. that I mean, people have lost. The next verse after this is pure religion before God and man is to help widows and orphans in their distress. And then immediately after that is if your faith does not have works, it is dead and it's not real. And so it's all tied together, all this concept. And it's a really interesting metaphor to use to talk about bridling the tongue. Because when you think about bridling the tongue, the first thing you want to do is say constraint and restraint and think about how you're holding something back. But it's also the way that you've domesticated a beast. It's a way that you've taken something that's wild and useful. powerful. And now you can use that to get from point A to point B or to take a heavy load in ways that you couldn't beforehand. It's actually a way to, to add strength, not just to hold things back. And I think that that leads right into the next verse, which is Proverbs 15, one through two. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. And I mean, you can see this Hopefully, you can probably see it in yourself if you've matured. You can see it in children. I mean, there's this part of it where, I mean, someone says something to you and you want to respond to them and just let them have it. You want to respond to them in kind. And even there's this can be a scenario where you have every justification to respond to them in this way. And can you recognize that in this situation, responding in that way, would be absolutely dangerous. And can you then, after having recognized that, control yourself, bridle your tongue, so that you speak them into a way that you produce profit out of the situation, that you turn the situation from one of contention to one of peace. I mean, these, this verse is just, it, it's speaking directly to what the last verse was saying, is that the tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. And there's this part of it where, I mean, when, you know, when you're young, you have like, you know, you have one technique and you're running around, you know, you're like a person with a hammer and you're running around looking for ways to, you know, to use your hammer. And scripture says, I mean, God says there's many different ways to use words at different times. There's different ways to speak. There's times to rebuke. There's times to correct. There's time to encourage. There's time. There's lots of different things that need to be done. And Part of, part of knowing God and part of being wise is learning when to do these things and being able to control yourself so that you don't just follow after your inclinations, that you're not following after your flesh. So when we think about this and the idea that a soft answer turns away wrath and that there's a wise way to use knowledge, I think it's worthwhile to consider. So, you know, back in James, it said that, you know, out of the same opening comes, should not come fresh water and salt water. So he's saying that words can either be fresh water or words can be salt water, the way we speak them, how, who we speak them to. And so we should consider ways that, that our words can be fresh water. And I think the first one is that you're actually thinking about how you're using them and you're, you know, the wise use words to help the situation, to improve the situation. 
they're not just using words for the sake of using words. They're not like the the horse that just wants to run wild. They're not like the fire that just wants to burn down the whole forest. They're actually, the wise says, how do I use words? Where do I water, right, to use the water metaphor? Where do I put water that will cause things to grow? And that's what you want to do with fresh water. Right, and you know, to know uh, how not to gossip, you have to know what, what gossip is. And there, there, might be, there might be various ways to define it. But yeah, I think one way would be to, to be speaking things that are not useful, that are not profitable, that are not helpful. Um, and you know, you, you know, there, you're a tail bearer. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't. That a tail bearer is telling instructive stories from whatever you know from history or something. That's not a tail bearer. A tail bearer is telling stories about other people, and uh, or possibly even themselves. But that those stories are not edifying to the people who are hearing them. Instead, they're actually hurting other people who are, you know, the people hearing them and, and the people that they're about. And I will say this, that, you know, it does have to do with intent, not even so, I mean, and, and we have to be very careful because we can lie to ourselves, but it has to do with intent and what the desire is, and not necessarily the words. For instance, I was doing a conference in Nigeria recently, and I said Benny Hinn was a heretic. Well, so was I tail-bearing? Well, these all, these people were idolizing Benny Hinn, so i very far from thinking that's, <laughs> that's gossip, right? I mean, I was coming there to warn them because I was trying to get them to stop following Benny Hinn, who's a heretic and he's a false teacher, and we could go on all about that. You're doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so obviously either I'm very wrong in what gossip is because I've deceived myself, or I'm saying we should be warning people, and you can't say, well, to warn people is gossip because that's not true because to edify the group of people that I said that to, to edify them, they had to understand they have to turn away from these things because they're destroying them. And so the intention, the purpose of saying it, it wasn't just, let's say, if we can disparage a man, make people think bad of a man. It was actually had a real intent to try to turn people from a way that was a path of destruction. So one of the ways that people often define gossip is it's saying things about another person that is potentially damaging to their reputation. Right. And I think that's not gossip. And that, <laughs> in, in your case, well, you were saying things that were potentially damaging to the reputation of Benny Hinn. They were damaging to his reputation amongst a bunch of people who thought highly of him. You were saying things that would bring him low. But... What really matters there is, number one, is what you're saying true? You know, right. do you have justification for what you're saying? That Can you back that up with scripture and evidence and so forth? But also, in the context that you're saying it, is it a useful thing for that group of people to hear? Is it useful for them to hear that there is a man who claims to follow God but actually isn't following God? Right. So don't follow him. Absolutely. I mean, there's no question that that's the case. But but if you look at a case like that, then you have to say, okay, we've got to redefine gossip. It can't be as simple as I can't say something damaging about somebody else's reputation. Right. And it's incredibly destructive to the church to have that definition. Because when you have that definition, there is no prevention against heresy. Right. So afterwards, somebody you know, in the Q&A after that session, somebody went, how dare you say this? You're naming names. You should never name names. And I'm like, well, I'll name some other names. Um, because, yes, you should name names. Because these people are following a people that, you know, Creflo Dollar, these people that are just, you know, idol idolize money. I mean, this is just ridiculous. And to not warn people is to sin against them. And so it's not gossip when you're warning somebody of destruction that's coming their way. It's no more gossip than it is to say the brake line in your car's cut. You should not get in and drive that car. Or the brake line in the Greyhound bus is cut. Right. When it's, you know, someone else or damaging their reputation. Right. But it's necessary. But it's necessary, and you can't turn around and say that's wrong because that is not gossip. That is what a necessary thing in the world to exalt truth and to hold truth up as, as something important and to hold Christ up as something important. And I think a lot of times the church goes to that definition of gossip, and that's just a completely incorrect definition biblically. At the same time, you do have to check your motives when you're doing this. Absolutely. Because there are so many pastors out there who all they would like to do is talk about how, 
well, so and so is a gossip, or so so and so is a, a heretic, and let's just hammer on them being a heretic because if I can say it loud enough, then you'll stop following them and you'll start following me. And there are people on the internet that that's all they do, right? Is that they just go after this person, this person's a heretic, and this person's a heretic, and this person's a heretic. Those are episodes like so and so in hell, or those well, are- <laughs> you're trying to make an argument there, but um, <laughs> but. But we have another 140 episodes that don't say that. Right. And there's a big difference between that. And some of these people, I mean, I've, you know, like when we were doing the one on Billy Graham, where is he a heretic? And, you know, you go and look out there and there's a lot of people saying that. And then you read a lot of what they hold and they're heretics too. And there's a point where you go, yeah, they're just, at that point it is gossip. They're not pointing out that he's a heretic because they're concerned that people will follow them because all they're doing is pushing another heresy. The reality is, is that they're trying to get people to follow them. And so that motive where one person is calling them out, not to get people to follow them, but to get people to turn from the person who they're calling out versus the people that call people out to try to get people to follow them. And they're, they're basically gossips and there's lots of channels out there like that. And, you know, the class, another classic example of this, you know, in a slightly different context is, you know, the, the forerunner of, um, of the gossip is here. Here's something you really need to be praying about. You know, here's X, Y, and Z that's happening to all these people we know. And, you know, I'm just telling you so you can pray for them. And maybe they... And I think when, yeah, I think, you know, in Baptist circles, Wednesday night is the usual prayer night. And I think that that's where most gossip happens in the church or the most intense gossip it's let's take prayer requests. And in those prayer requests, and I've been in churches like this, they spend 20 minutes gossiping about people because they're just preparing to pray for them. It's like, no. <laughs> you can say, this person's sick, pray for their healing. You don't have to go into all these details where you're like showing off how much knowledge you have about the person. And, and you say the things that need to be said so that the person can pray the way they should pray for them. I mean, in, in Scripture, I mean, gives there are principles that Scripture gives. You know, when you look at like uh, the church discipline in Matthew 18, when you've got someone who's offended you or they've done something, they sin against you. Those structures there are actually designed to keep the knowledge of a particular sin against you constrained to as small a group as possible, right? I mean, a person sins against you, you go to them and you speak to them in private, and if you've reached resolution, it doesn't you, say it's sin. It actually says offended. Offended you, you right? I mean, because so, you may be the one in sin, right? <laughs> and so you, but in the end, if there's resolution there, that may never get spoken of to anyone outside, and and realistically, shouldn't be unless you're telling of how God ch- taught you something so that you can bless other people. And again, being mindful of you shouldn't be sharing things that you shouldn't share. I mean, but it is designed to constrain the knowledge of those things, and then it goes to you know, to two or three brothers, and then it gets brought to the whole church. And then there's other things where Scripture says there are works of darkness that need to be exposed immediately. And the, and and this is kind of what we've been talking about, is Scripture actually gives guidelines to help us think about those things. In the situation where the brothers offended you, this isn't like he raped your daughter. This right. isn't he murdered someone. This isn't even he did some great sin that does need to be exposed. This is or you've the, been offended. Or historically, it's been that the the level of exposure should always be the same, at, around the same level as the level of knowledge. Right. So if somebody taught heresy and these people were reading Benny Hinn's, you know, watching his videos and reading his books and stuff, then yes, it's completely legitimate to confront them and go, "This is he's a heretic." Or if he's but, distributing it worldwide, I mean, it's reasonable right, to speak right. to anyone anywhere in the world about it, right? Right. But if you're, but if you've got some little internet her- heretic somewhere, and and you have a larger platform, and you just want to say, hey, I want everybody out there to know that this person is a heretic. There's this, there's this growing heresy. All you've done actually is you've inflated the potential reach of that person, right? In in order to puff yourself up, and right. you haven't actually edified your audience that had no temptation ever to follow after this person that now you've shown light on. Right. And so, I mean, again, we've kind of talked about what fresh water looks like. And the first thing is really the intent. What are you actually trying to accomplish? You know, the Bible said that God takes every idle word into judgment. And if you have no intention to accomplish anything, that's a righteous thing to do then you know it's an idle word that God will judge. So it could be true. It could be that you're speaking it to people that 
might even be useful for them to know. But if you're not, if your intent is not to do good with it, it's it's an idle word. It's a word that's not intended to profit. And another way to even say that is that anything not done of faith is sin. And so there's this part of it where you actually have to have real faith that what you're doing is going to be beneficial. You can't fake it. You can't. I mean, you should have faith through reason, through thought, through scripture to say, I believe this is something that that is going to benefit them. Kind of that picture of bridling your tongue. You have to be steering it where it's going so that it's accomplishing. It's getting you where you want to be. You know, and when we consider that, it is important to remember Jeremiah 17, 9 which is the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. James is also saying, hey, if you're, if you're religious, then you're bridling your tongue. But people can deceive themselves about how righteous they are, and they can look and they can lie to themselves about the motives. So you really have to be careful because people, there's a lot of people, we just did one on Assurance of Salvation, a podcast, and there's lots of people that, that are so sure they're saved, but if they actually examine their heart, and examine why they want to say something and how they're saying it and who they're saying it to, they can be very deceived. Watch your words. Your words will show whether you're whether you're providing you know fresh water or salt water. One of the most common phrase that you, phrases that you use before someone gossips is, I'm not sure if I should tell you this or not, but I'm going to go ahead and, and do it. And usually the best response is don't. Right. <laughs> and sometimes even more active. I mean, like it is, I'm not kidding. You say another word, I'm walking away, I'm turning off the phone. You do not, you've just told me you don't have faith that you should do this. Go figure out whether you should say it or not before you say it. And and another, you know, if you're on telltale signs, another one is, you know, don't tell anyone I told you this. Yeah, you know, my standard answer to that is don't tell anybody I said this is I'm not going to promise that. I don't know what you're going to tell me. There's no way I'm going to promise that. You have to trust that I will do the right thing with it or don't tell me because I'm not going to make a promise to you that all of a sudden you tell me that you're molesting your daughter and I'm not supposed to say anything. Really, I'm going to promise that? Under no circumstances will I promise that. And, you know, if, it's, if you have your tongue bridled and you're going to say things to the right person and the person trusts that you have your tongue bridled, then they can tell you. And if they ask you, don't say it to anybody else, then first of all, they're probably saying it because they expect you to say it to somebody else and they're trying to convince you to gossip because that is a standard way to spread gossip is to tell people don't tell anybody because that puts in their heart a desire to tell people. But we should never make that promise because if it's useful to say, we have an obligation to say if it's necessary to say. And if it's not, then we should, you know, we shouldn't say it anyway and they shouldn't have told us. So the first thing about, you know, it, it being fresh water rather than gossip, rather than salt water, is that, that it's useful, that it has an intent and a purpose that you're trying to accomplish. And the, the next is not just that you have a purpose, but that you're doing it with, a, with the right intent towards the person. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. If you're not actually, yes, you might want to accomplish good, but if you're not doing it saying, I'm trying to accomplish good for this person because I care about this person, then you can end up you can you end up, first of all, not accomplishing your good intent. Because people tell can tell. They can tell why you're doing it. And so you could tell something that would be very useful for them to know, but you say it in such a way that that they get offended by it or that they go, Oh, I should go attack somebody else with this. Instead of going, no, I'm telling you this because you need to hear it because I'm trying to be a blessing to you. I'm trying to help you. Well, I mean, so then if that's the case, dissect your calling out of Benny Hinn to a group of people where the fact of you saying it was offensive. Were you unloving in that circumstance? Yes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 I, was, just, I, was, I was really nervous there. <laughs> no, so if you, you know, I've been to Nigeria a number of times, and when you're in Nigeria, you see the amount of destruction that has happened in the church and the amount of destruction that has happened to people because, because they follow people like Benny Hinn and all they want are signs. Or they follow a person like Creflo Dollar, which is all they want to do is get rich. They're lacking everything that matters in life. They're lacking spirituality. They're lacking a trust in Christ. They're lacking 
that Jesus Christ being their all in all. And until you confront them in that so that they see their idolatry, you can't deliver them from their idolatry. Because what they'll always do is the same thing that Israel did. If you look through the history of Israel, what Israel would do is they'd keep worshiping Jehovah the whole time, but they'd bring in Baal. They'd bring in Dagon. They'd bring in all the gods around them, and they would worship them and Jehovah. And so unless you tear down Baal, you can't get them to just worship Jehovah. So no, it's a loving thing to say. You can't keep worshiping Benny Hinn and think you're worshiping Christ. Christ won't accept that. So I can teach you all the things I want to about Christ. And you can say, yes, you believe. But if you continue to follow Benny Hinn, it doesn't matter. You're still an idolater and you haven't turned towards the living God. There's a part of it where when you talk about, are you saying this with love is you know, a, a, a simple way to think of it is, I mean, it's, this isn't the final test, but it is to ask yourself, would I want someone to do this to me? I mean, scripture says, you know, that, you know, Love the Lord love your God with all your yourself. heart and love it. Yeah, love your neighbor as yourself. And so there's just part of it where you're like, if I was in the same circumstance, would I want someone to do this to me? Is this something that I would see, I can see as a loving thing? That you might end up going, now, I'm not the person to say this to them. Sometimes that's true. You may find there, there may be other qualifiers, but at a minimum, it should be something that you should want. You should be able to argue, yes, I would want someone to do this. Absolutely. Otherwise, you shouldn't do it. And that's, yeah, when you talk about bridling the tongue, that's a really good point, that sometimes the right answer is, they'll never hear it from me. So I want them to hear this, but I should get somebody else to say it that they'll hear it from. Because if it's gossip, you'll go, I want to say it because I want people to know that I knew. I was the one that warned you. I was the one that did it. I was the one with the unbridled tongue. What you're trying to do is to be a blessing. You actually sit back and go, who would be better? Would it be better for me to say it or would it be better for somebody else to say it? And you actually think that through because that is what's loving. If you're trying to be a blessing to that person, you don't go, oh, I need to say this. Sometimes you go, you know, I think this would be better for, you know, and I, it's frequent at Reformation, shepherding the church. There's a, a significant number of times that I'll tell my wife, you should go tell this person this because I think they'll be much more likely to hear it from you than they will from me. I, mean, I remember years ago you preached a sermon on, on, on church discipline in Matthew 18, and, and I remember you saying something that I should have thought of, but I, I remember I really had never considered. It's when you do go to the point of you go to your brother and then you need to take two or three witnesses, how you think about who those other two people are. It's very easy to find people who will support your cause, people who are on your side. The real answer should be, how do I take people with me who my brother will hear? Right. How do I choose people who he is willing to hear? And they may be people who they may not even like you that much. You know what I mean? They may be people who they're much, but if you can bring them with you, you can actually have a much better chance of winning your brother. And, and this is the thinking that should be in our minds is, do I actually care about the person I'm speaking to? If I do, I'll think about the right way to love them. This does not mean that you can always pawn off having to have a difficult conversation, right? <laughs> which is a, which, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking through the way I would use what's just been said to get right. out, yeah, you know, is, is, oh, this seems like a really difficult thing. I know Dan likes having difficult conversations I'll, with I'll people. I'll tell him about this situation. They're a better friend than <laughs> exactly. that person. And I'll go get Dan to have the conversation with them. You should tell him about Benny Hinn, Dan. <laughs> But there's some people do that to me, by the way. I know. I know. I'm, I've probably done it before. <laughs> there's a really good diagnosis, a self-diagnosis in this, though, where if you know there's information that needs to get out, it's going to be useful for this person. Would I be offended if that information came from another source, if I didn't get to tell the story? If I, if I would be offended that somebody else got to tell the story, then... I was at the point there where I was all set up to I might up. be compromised. I might just be fundamentally compromised here. Right. <laughs> and sometimes the answer might be, I'm fundamentally compromised, but I still need to say it. Right. Right? Because we, I mean, and I that's where gossip gets it. to be really, really complicated because at times you might go, yeah, I'm really tempted to gossip with this. But at the same time, they need to hear it. They need to know it. I'm the one that has the information. I need to say it. And so... Even when we're doing it for a good reason, we always have to check ourselves and make sure that we're not we're not fulfilling fleshly desires. But we should have faith that the process of if we're able to repent before we do it, that that repentance is very likely going to affect the efficacy of, of the conversation sure. we have. I mean, we really should have that it's because in the end, it's not just words that are said. It's God who gives it's God who gives the blessing from those words. 
And so you can have, this is what we're talking about being a, a clanging symbol. That's word spoken without faith, word spoken without love. And that, that in the process is part of whether you love. The process is whether you have faith. And something we've kind of been alluding to is that, you know, when you're saying things that need to be said, um, it doesn't stop other people from taking it as gossip. You know, something, you know, you know, think, things like in the media, you know, there's things that evil that has been done that need to be revealed and that certain people need to know. And the only way to get those people to know is to put it out publicly. If you're, you know, in, if you're in the media organization, all you can do is put it out publicly. And yet maybe 90 percent of the people who read your article are just going to take it as a tasty trifle. And unfortunately, there's no way to stop that. Right. They may hate you for it. They may, I mean, yeah, all sorts right. or of love reactions. you for it even worse. Right. Right. Well, in in. And you also have to be really careful, right? Because the tasty trifle that causes somebody to look bad at somebody, if they should look bad at them, that's not that bad of collateral damage. If they shouldn't look bad at them, it's really bad collateral damage. So when you write that article, and I think this is even part of how we've gotten so polarized in this country, is that people write it not caring whether it's actually going to give people a more accurate assessment of who the person is. Right. I mean, but, but but what I'm more talking about is when it's someone that you don't really need to know anything about, but now you know all, you know, or most of the people reading the article don't even need to know anything about this person, but now they do because they read the article. I mean, we mentioned this earlier. We've done, we've done a Rob, is Ravi Zacharias in hell? We did one on Billy Graham. We did one on Martin Luther King Jr. We're probably going to do some in the future on people like Finney or, or uh, uh, John Wesley I mean, and there's this part of it where, I mean, we actually have a number of conversations before we do. I mean, we actually go through the process of asking, is this person worth discussing? Why are they worth discussing? What impact have they had on the church? Is this something, you know, I mean, the reason why we do Billy Graham is because Does it of heal the, the church. Right. Yeah. The major impact. And it's like the church actually needs to move past Billy Graham to actually have some have repentance in the church to actually see progress in certain areas. And so, I mean, I think it's worth, I just want to say this and you feel free to kind of come and go, you're still horribly wrong or point out reasons why we shouldn't do this if you actually have something. But I mean, it, it would be really hypocritical if we weren't doing this process when we thought about what should we do an episode on, you know, because in the end, we're not just out there going, who could we say something about? Ooh, we could say this and that. Would we, we do look and say, who do we think it's worth addressing because of the damage that's been caused, because of the hurt we can actually see? And that and, matters. And, and, yeah, like Robbie Zacharias, the reason we did Robbie Zacharias is there's a bunch of people that are so, so sure they're saved because of their attendance at church and other things. And you look at Robbie Zacharias, and it's like he wasn't saved. So you should be afraid for yourself and work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, right? I mean, we had a real agenda there, and it wasn't just to badmouth Ravi Zacharias. Right. It was to go, if Ravi Zacharias, who wrote all these theo theology books, if he spoke at all these places, he had all these debates, and yet he had this hidden life that he was an adulterer, and so he wasn't saved biblically, you should really, you need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And Billy Graham, it's like, do you wonder why the church doesn't have any influence in the world? Billy Graham was the, the friend of every president, and he's the pastor of America. Well, he's preaching a false gospel, a gospel that doesn't change the culture, doesn't change the society. And as long as we're preaching the gospel that he preaches, the church will have no impact. And these are the things that the church needs to be doing. And to say silent with these leaders, well, you can't get the church to be fixed without, without dealing with the problems that have been introduced by these men. So we've talked about, you know, what does fresh water look like? And another thing that fresh water looks like is it's, it's aimed at the right place. For instance, if you're thinking about talking to somebody because you need to deal with a problem, you know, like a child, it's easy to think of with a child. When you think of a child, you don't go and tell all the men in the church about the problem with the child. You go and talk to the father or the mother and God has set structures in place that people have the ability to deal with other people's sin. And they have the responsibility, like it says in Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Now that's talking about elders, but the same thing holds for other 
authorities is that if you have something to say, deal with the people that can have the most influence in the matter. If you're really trying to fix a problem, then you're going to choose who you talk to about it very carefully. Because if the person, the elder has to give an account to the soul, their soul, it makes a lot more sense to talk to the elder in your church rather than the guy who's sitting in the pew next to you. And so I think a lot of times if we want fresh water, it really is. You have to direct it where it, where it can actually make a difference, where it can actually help to the father, to the pastor, to somebody who you know has, has the ear of the person that they will hear them instead of just going, I'm just going to talk to people randomly. And, you know, I mean, the, the person that you want to talk to in a large chunk of the situation is just the person involved. Yeah. You, know, you know, on a one, to, on, you know, an, in a person you know, you think they've done something wrong. I mean, the person you need to talk to is them. Right. Um, you know, I mean, there are exceptions, but it can be really easy to just jump on those exceptions and say, well, I need advice about what, how I talk to this person. Well, there are probably times that you do, but there's, you know, few, few people like having difficult conversations. And so there's a large incentive to go talk to somebody else about it instead of just talking to the person that can actually deal with it. Right. The talking to somebody else, there is a place to talk to somebody else, but the place is almost always after you've talked to the person originally and not talked to somebody else. So you don't jump to talk to the second person, the first person that's involved. And then if you don't get the problem resolved, there can be a real issue of saying, well, I need to bring somebody else involved or get somebody else involved so that they know what's going on. And then you do it wisely. You don't just go with who will be most interested in the gossip or your gossiping. Right. And even when you're dealing with children, I mean, the right answer of how to involve their parents and when to involve their parents has to do, I mean, you can look at things that are real indicators in the church, like is this child old enough that the parent, that they, they do things, that their parents are mm -hmm. allowing them to go and do certain actions out in the world they may be someone that you can go and talk to them directly. Are they a member of the church? If they're a member of the church, my answer is you should talk to them directly. Right. Because if, right. Because if they're a communicant member of the of your church, then you have a relationship with them, and I mean you have, and even a direct responsibility to them. And there can be times where the right answer is to go, "Hey, I had a conversation with so and so. He can tell you about it." If you know, what I mean, and, and right. It doesn't mean that that just because you talk to the person in a case where there is an authority like that, a lot of times, or not a lot of times, but but certainly a significant percentage of the times there's really an obligation to, you don't, yes, you've dealt with the 12 year old child, but there's a good chance you should tell one of their parents as well. Right. And you don't go, that's gossip because they have real authority. They have real responsibility right. over the person and it's not inherently gossip. But if you're just trying to pick everything that you can find about the child to tell the parent, then you become a gossip right. where you've dealt with it and you know that they heard you and you know that they're not going to do it. And, you know, and so it is a, a line there that we probably make it out to be finer than it really is. People really, you know, they know if they're saying it just to try to, to, to be puffed up and have people hear them and think that they know things versus actually trying to be a blessing. And, and part of the problem is, is the church really doesn't understand authority. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, like you've seen people who they go to the highest ranking person they can find as opposed to the person right above a pro I mean, they just, you know, I mean, we just, we, we, we don't think about these things. We don't think about them from the perspective of why God created authority, what how to be loving to someone. We just, we've, we've lost our ability to even have traction with those things. And sometimes it's that we, we don't understand. And a lot of times, though, I think it is that we do understand. And right. We just, you know, hey, we want to have I can talk to this person them. who's higher up because he'll listen to me. I because mean, this you know, is the means by which you get to speak I get to recognition. Them. This is the means by which people will go, oh, look, he's trying right. to actively help the church. Look how holy he is. Look how important he is to the church. And you start to, instead of talking to, you know, somebody who could deal with it at a lower level, you move up just for the sake of pride. And so we've been talking about some of the aspects of, of fresh water. And we should also talk about what does salt water look like? I think the first thing to recognize is that the words that are tearing down, those are words that are satanic. They're demonic. This is where they come from. God uses words to build up. God uses words to edify. When man uses words to tear down, when man uses words to build himself up rather than to help and be a blessing to the other person, He's doing the same thing Satan did in the garden to Eve. Well, let me tell you, did God really say? That's the same thing that a lot of gossips do. And so we should recognize the source of that gossip is Satan. 
Revelation 12, 9 and 10 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. When we go and we attack with our words, when we go and we try to tear people down, that's what Satan does. And we need to recognize that we're doing the works of our Father who is Satan when we do that. This isn't some idle thing. It's not some, some secondary thing. This is, I mean, Christ, or Satan, a term for him is the slanderer. And so when we think about gossip, it's not just this, oh, look at what Satan does. Satan does horrible things like convince people to murder people. No, he accuses the brethren. He slanders and lies about people. And he's a gossip. I mean, I, th- I think it's, I want to really emphasize one thing you said there, that you said these are demonic, satanic things. And I mean, I think it's important to understand when we think, because so often what people think of as satanic and demonic is just weird, occultic, you know what I mean? Like, right. And, and no, sat- I mean, the reason why occultic things are satanic and demonic is because they deceive. You know what I mean? I mean, when it says mm-hmm. Satan who deceives the whole world, who, ca- who, who causes sin, who causes lying, that's why those things are satanic and demonic. But that's not the core of what satanic and demonic is. It's what you're talking about here. It's that he was a liar from the beginning. Is that he was the one who accused the brethren. And so, I mean, I think that's really important because part of Satan's deception is tricking people into thinking of the wrong things as being satanic. That's really useful to him. What's really what needs to be done is the church needs to remember, no, the, the people of God can be, remember Satan is like an angel of light, that they go around saying, I'm doing the work of God by saying these words, and they are tearing people down, and they are causing destruction. And it really is that, that picture of him being an angel of light. That's what a lot of gossips do. Is I'm just telling you this just because it, it might affect you, so I think you should really know. And what they're really doing is attacking people. They're attacking people or they're acting like they're doing good, that they're trying to be loving, that they're trying to, that they really care about the people. Let me give you a prayer request, right? I mean, these are the things that happen all the time in churches. And and that looks more like Satan than it does Christ. I think this, this ties directly into uh, 2 Timothy 3.12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Because this is who Satan is, because Satan is the accuser of the brethren, because Satan used to be able to go before the throne of God and accuse. And now power has been, has been greatly reduced, and there's much more that those who follow after him do this work. But he will attack those who are Christians. The work of Satan is to persecute those who truly follow after Christ. And that is a mark of, of gossiping, is that it will cause those who follow after Christ, it will be used to cause them to suffer persecution. Right. So we should expect gossip against us. That's, that's, you know, the most common form of persecution is gossip. I would say it's not getting tied to a stake and burnt, although that has certainly happened in church history. The most common one is, is you get gossiped against. That's why Jesus Christ on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 11 through 12 said, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The prophets all got gossiped against. The prophets all got people going around telling false things. This is, this is what we should expect as Christians. But that also means we should be really warned if that salt water is coming from our mouth. We are not the ones that are exalting the prophets or, or you, know, you know, Jesus Christ said, you, you come and decorate the sepulchers of the prophets because you say that you're the followers of the prophets. You're not the followers of the prophets. You're the followers of the ones who killed the prophets. And I think there's a lot of people who go there and they're the ones that are actually persecuting. They are the ones saying false things and they think they're being religious. They think they're being righteous. But the reality is they're the persecutors. They're on the wrong side. And I mean, when you, yeah, when you hear something and it offends you and your thought is to say something evil about the person who offended you, 
this is gossip. I mean, this is, I mean, this is what we've already talked about. I mean, there's a part of it where if, if a brother, if they're a brother and they offended you, you need to go to them. You need to go to them very specifically. I mean, and this is, again, this is different than teaching heresy. This is different than doing other these things. But I mean, but often what happens is, is a Christian does something that God commanded him to do and it causes someone to be offended. And the person who is offended is going to go and gossip about the person who offended them, that they caused offense in them. Whereas the, re- the correct response should be, recognize that you're in error to humble yourself and to repent. We should also recognize what happens. One of the reasons people gossip is because they're trying to inflate themselves. They're trying to make themselves look better. They're trying to get other people to look at them as if they're better people, that somehow they're in a better category, that they're not like these other people, or maybe they just have more knowledge than other people. And we should just recognize that, that, it is about puffing themselves up. And a technique that they frequently use is to puff up the person that they're talking to. You know, Proverbs 20, 19 says, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. And so when somebody is using things that they're going, oh, yeah, you usually know everything, so let me tell you this because you probably need to know it. I don't, you know, in, in there you can very subtly flatter. But... You know, and so flattery and gossip are frequently joined together because the person that you're talking to, you're trying to make them think they're more important than they are. And by that, you're making yourself to be more important than you are. You don't notice this because you've been, you've frequently been in this position of authority. But anytime you're told a secret, it's, fl- it's meant to be flattering. You were worthy or needed, were needful to deal with this secret. And I mean, and th- I mean, and because in the end, when someone comes, to because basically you're the one that can actually handle this, right? Yeah. You can you can help with this. You can because in the end, the, the idea I mean, is it's like, you're, oh, you just giving me more obligation, <laughs> right? I mean, and there's a part where I mean, if you're an authority, people always want to come to authorities and tell them things because it get like I said, unless it might reflect badly right. on them or. But I mean, yeah. it's it's a means by which to speak to someone in authority. But the idea is, is you're the only person they're telling this to. It's a secret. I mean, you know, in realist, in reality, they're telling everyone this secret and making it like it's a secret when they tell them. But that's flattering, and people just have to recognize when you're being told something that is a secret. You I mean that should that should cause you that's being pitched to you as a secret that should cause you to be on guard, because in the end, frequently secrets are being told to you to flatter you, and that is that is just fundamental to what they do. And so, if you see someone who's a flatterer and they come and tell you a secret. You have real, real reason to suspect. Wait a minute, <laughs> this person. This is something they already are, already know they do. But secrets. That's the nature of them, right? And that's the nature of gossip, right? Is that you're telling somebody a secret, right? You can't separate gossip from the idea of you're inflating that person. You're lifting them up by going, "Look, you have a piece of information." Now, if you're talking to somebody that can actually act on it and it produces right. an obligation, when people tell me things, my usual response is, "Oh, now I have to deal with that." Not, oh, good, I get to know this, but now I have another obligation of things to do because when you're in a certain position, that becomes your responsibility. And so it's a burden that's not flattery. God does it with the church. I mean, look at how many times Paul talks about this is a great mystery, and I'm going to tell you about it. This has been kept hidden, and I'm telling you, I mean, God, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, because of the work he has for us to do, God tells the church things that he has kept hidden from the foundation of the world because he has work for them to do with that. Right. But so it's not fundamentally evil to tell someone a secret when it is necessary, but you should just be on guard. And you should ask people, why are they telling me? Right. When somebody says, oh, you need to know this, your first question should be, why? Right. Now, obviously, if it's, you need to know this about your son, you don't go, why? You go, okay, what do I need to know about my son? Because I have authority. If you go, right. do you know this is going on in the church to me as an elder? I go, yeah, what are you talking about? But, but other if- than that, in a lot of cases, it should just be, why are you telling me? Another reason why people gossip is that that they're they're using the gossip as a reason to complain about what's going on in the world. So somebody does something and go, can you believe? I remember when my office once there was a guy who i told him i could do that in a half an hour and he's like but it will take me four hours and i'm like yeah go do it and he went and called like everybody in the company to go how dare dan tell me that his time's more valuable than mine it's like well 
Otherwise, you wouldn't have a job. <laughs> you know, it was kind of really basic, but he didn't get that. But the reason he went and gossiped is it was actually a form of grumbling and complaining. It was actually a form of going, how could this happen? Because a lot of times gossip is personal, that it affected you. And you're going, how could this person have done this to me? So you go around and you say these things and you go, well, it was done to me, so I have the right to talk about it. And God actually says a lot about how evil grumbling and complaining is. Like in Philippians 2, 14 through 16. Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. When we look at like 1 Corinthians 10, where God says they all grumbled in the wilderness, and that's why he killed them all. It's very easy to to think that grumbling and complaining to to you know to do these things and just to be talking to people about how things are unfair, or how things shouldn't be this way, or how all those things like they're a minor sin. And and God's really clear: this is not a minor sin. This is what He did. This is why He kept killing people in the wilderness for forty years, is because it's not a minor sin. And gossip frequently is an excuse to sin in this way. I mean, and this is this is important for a lot of reasons because I mean, I remember during the coronavirus lockdown, we went a group of us went to protest, and there was a threat of I mean, very very evil action. There was a threat of arrest. You were told you were not allowed to protest, even if you sat inside your car in a parking lot. You could not stay there. You had to leave, or they would arrest you. And I went home, and I was very I mean, I ended up calling all my local representatives, and none of that's wrong. But the reason I did it was because I was personally offended. I, I didn't call them because because this was unrighteous. I didn't. I mean, sure, that was part that was part of the reason I was offended. But I was offended because I was there. I was offended because it happened to me. I was offended because and and there's this part of it where when you look at this, even if if I had actually been able to repent of my particular the reason why I was doing it, my calls would have been more effective. Right. Because in the end, when my calls came, it was it sounded like someone who had been offended who was calling their representative because they had been offended, as opposed to someone calling with passion and conviction going, this is evil, and you should not allow such a thing to happen. And, and so I think there's this part of it where when you think about this, like the person who, we, when we try to, when we create a culture that doesn't allow these things to happen, we refine, we refine everything because of it. I mean, in the end, you cause people to have better motives for doing what they do. Even if they're doing it still for self-aggrandization, it causes the, the, their ostensible reason for doing it to become purer. And so, I mean, I think there's this part of it where, I mean, we just really need to understand this, that this affects, it affects so many aspects of why we do what we do. Because in the end, in the political side, there are unethical politicians who are really looking to channel the outrage of people right. and the outrage of people is not a fundamentally effective tool for long-term positive growth it's it's sure it can have positive effects but in the end it's much better to have a populace who actually cares about things for principled reasons and not just because they're upset the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of god right I mean, as james 1 19 to 22 says at, at length so then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. When we think of all these things that we've been talking about, you know, God gives us some like broad things to consider, and that's just, are you being slow to speak? Because if you're being quick to speak, you should be asking yourself, do you think it's by your power that you're going to change the world, that it's by your power that you're going to cause things to get better and to turn towards righteousness? Or do you say it's the power of God, and so I should be saying, how do I submit to God here? How do I do what God tells me to do here? Rather than saying, I'm going to get my vengeance. We really have to be very quick to say, vengeance belongs to the Lord. Often when we're swift to speak, what we're really doing is we're, we're putting speaking before thinking. I mean, that's just very common. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, and so there's this part of it where so much of what we've talked about is the words you say, if you're going to bridle your tongue, you have to put thinking first. 
you have to think, you have to consider. You you don't just recklessly go and begin to say words. And I mean, otherwise you end up yeah in a multitude of words. There one is not sin, and so there's this part of it where the more you speak, the more dangerous you know, the more likely you are to cause damage. I can't tell you. I mean, it's like how many times have you started to you know. If you started to write an email, email, you know there are certain methods that slow down, that slow you down, and there are certain things where you type it, and after having typed it, you realize you were just angry. You know what I mean? You realize, and, and you delete the email, you delete the Facebook comment, you realize there's no profit in this, and the earlier you can do that, the less time you waste, but also just the less damage you cause, the less foolishness that you get involved in. And. A thread that runs through a lot of these verses is that you're at risk of deceiving yourself. It's all over the place in these verses. And so just check, are you quick to speak or do you have some kind of constraint on your tongue? Do you have some kind of control on it? Otherwise, you are deceiving yourself. And it's really hard to diagnose when you're deceiving yourself by definition. And so here's the word of God coming in saying, Check, check, check. This is something you've got to watch out for. And, you know, I think a lot of the episode we've been kind of, you know, targeting a particular kind of gossip where you're going, you know, to other, you know, other people, you know, outside of your household. Um, But, you know, this is also very much true inside your household that you need to be slow to speak Um, because there's a lot of, I mean, it's really easy to, you know, talk to your kids and have a lot more freedom in what you'll say with them than you would to other people in the church. Other people in the church, perhaps, are going to be very careful not to gossip, and then at home you'll just tear people apart. Um, and and you still have the duty to be slow to speak to your children. I mean, perhaps in some ways even more so. I mean, it also applies between the husband and wife, although I think there's probably more freedom. It's still very possible to gossip between the husband and the wife about other people in a way that's not edifying to either of you and it's just tearing down your opinion of other people and not and not edifying anyone. I mean, because of that freedom between the husband and wife, there can be great danger there. I mean, I, I think I've probably, I may have shared the story in another episode about something else specifically, but I mean, I remember early on we had two small children and after one of the services, one of the elders came up to me and they said something about my children's behavior. And I remember going home and I went to my wife and I went, the elder came up to me afterwards and said, our children's behavior, you know what I mean? And, and, and I just, first of all, I put it all on the elder I put, and I made my wife very defensive toward the elder. I made her very, you know, she was kind of a little bit offended because I was both relaying his message in a different way than he had said it and I'm making it more impersonal. And I really caused a lot of damage in that situation where in reality, what I should have done is I should have taken the words he said, determined whether they were valid and if they were, say, okay, I think I've noticed this in our children and we should do these things. And that would have been very different than right. what I did. And it's very common for people to use someone else as kind of a foil, use someone, I'm going to take their words. And, I'm in, and we very rarely actually recount someone else's words accurately. And it's very easy to even put a spin on them so that we, we cause great harm. And so in our relationship with our wife, I mean, we should really be aware. I know a lot of churches where, you know, Every person that's listening to this and that's in a church, your wife has people in the church that she doesn't care for that much. And you do too. And it's really easy for you to use your words. Like there are people who you don't want her to have a good relationship with because you don't really want to have a good relationship with them. And so you could cause her to feel more – you could tell, make sure you only tell her about things they do that will stir up her dislike of that person. It's very easy to do this sort of thing and to cause – horrible harm within the church as opposed to the church coming together and you showing the good things of this person and the way that God is using them and positive things. I mean, as well as it's easy for you to cover up, you know, cover up sins that other people have done because you want to protect your relationship with someone that's not positive for you in the church and that's harmful. I mean, these are really common sins that happen between husbands and wives. You kind of have both there that, you know, we do have to live openly before our spouses, right? We have to walk in light, not darkness. So it takes great wisdom to understand what things you should say and what you shouldn't. And part of it is if the wife is, if later if the wife is going to go, I really need to know that, 
then you probably had to say something. Right. And you should really evaluate that because if she's going to think that this is operative to how she's going to live, and yes. I mean that she's not arbitrary, right? If she's arbitrary in her judgment, then you don't. But but at the same time, you don't have the obligation to say everything and you don't have the obligation to say everything like verbatim. Right. Because sometimes it's better to to treat her as the weaker vessel. Men should be able to say things more bluntly to each other than when we speak to wives and we speak to women because they God did give us different you know different men are supposed to men are supposed to be able to go out and battle and if you can't battle with words then why do you think you could battle with swords women aren't sent out to battle in the same way and so we should be careful to walk that line where we are living and walking in light before our wives but at the same time not necessarily making them fight our battles for us and being discreet about what you say is that isn't just um you know impacting you know your wife and how she's hearing it it's also impacting you because you're disciplining yourself in the way you're expressing it like you know if you were offended at something but you discipline yourself in the way you you know you had a conversation and you came out offended but if you discipline yourself in the way you describe it so that you are being fair to what they said you are acknowledging that this person isn't you know a demon that they have good things about them you know and perhaps you're still expressing your your offense but yet you can do it in a way that is you know not only helping your wife but it's actually helping yourself because you have you're reminding yourself of these things because you know you have to say them right and grumbling and complaining is still a sin and and if you just go i can just repeat it then in the end you're you're just saying this isn't a sin as opposed to i need to really discipline myself and it, i i want to go back to what you were saying about children because i think that's really a that's really important is a lot of times we can have conversations when your children are small, you can have conversations with your wife and not think your children are hearing, but they absolutely are hearing. And it's easy to kind of forget that they're there and that they're listening, but they are there and they are listening and where your wife might know how to handle it. And you need to have enough background with her and enough in enough context that the words that you're saying are not affecting her in a negative way. Don't deceive yourself about how much you can harm your children. There have been lots of church splits and lots of problems that have been caused in churches because of, of parents talking to each other in a way that their children are not in the, capable of understanding and not incapable of putting it in the right context and the right position. And the children end up being offended and get to be a real problem. Right. I mean, you know, the, the Salem witch trials are, you know, a pretty, pretty well-known event. And one element of that very likely was you know, the daughter of the pastor hearing negative stuff about other people in the church. And then she ends up using them of witchcraft. And maybe if, she, if they're in there, very likely was gossip going on that it could have, you know, people may have died because of this gossip, you know, as the sin grew and grew. It certainly seems likely since I think all the ones that she were accusing were ones that her father had already complained about. I mean, the, and at the same time, you need to be aware of the fact that you will teach your children the right way to talk about other people. Right. I mean, and because there is this part of it where we also must speak about people and we must, you know, there's times where the mm -hmm. topic of conversation is how do we describe what other people did? How do we describe that charitably? How do we, how do we do these things? I mean, and, and I even want to go forward to I mean, go forward. <laughs> I want to go back to something that you said about men, you know, that men have to fight with words and, and, and fighting. There's a part of it where within the church, there should be this, there should be this expectation. I think it is a proper attitude within the church that when you speak of something in public in front of the other church, other people are going to talk about what you have said publicly. And that should and there's this part of it where in some churches it's if someone says something publicly, you even in that situation, you shouldn't ever say anything to anybody else about what they said publicly. And there are churches where they use that to actually they use this false definition of gossip to constrain the church because people who are liars what they'll do is they'll say something publicly they'll say something over here privately they'll say something over here privately and their expectation is, is that no one will ever be able to speak of the things that they've done so these things will never be connected they'll never be talked about i mean and even there's a certain sense where even conversations you have with people not that you should be exposing all of them but there are times in the church where there's great evil going on and you can have someone who they said something publicly and they said something very different to you privately. There are times in the church where you would want to go, he, when he talked to me, hypocrite. he told me something very differently privately. That's not what he told me. And 
that can be necessary for the health of the church. And I mean, and again, these things, they have to be done carefully. They shouldn't be done flippantly and foolishly. But you can create these fake rules that, you know, that was a private conversation, so it can never be spoken of publicly. That is not said anywhere in Scripture. That is not something that a private conversation sometimes must be spoken of publicly, or you will cause great harm. And there's other times where speaking of a private conversation can cause great harm. And you have to actually be able to think through principles and understand them. And one of the things that I've heard people twist, right, is where it says, do not entertain an accusation against an elder without two or three witnesses. And they go, therefore, if you know something bad about an elder, you don't have two or three witnesses, so you can't talk about anything. And people I've heard and been in a church where I've experienced this, where people are using that as a means to cause sin to be hidden. And where in Ephesians 5, where it says, expose the hidden works of darkness, those processes are not in place to cause the leaven to grow in the church. Now, when it says don't entertain an accusation against an elder without two or three witnesses, it doesn't mean that if you know something bad going on that you should go and gossip about it to everybody. But at the same time, if you think, well, he did this to me and maybe he did this to this person, so I'll judiciously ask, it's not like, oh, that person should stay silent because otherwise, how do you ever get two or three witnesses? It requires conversation for you to have two or three witnesses. And that verse is not saying you can never accuse an elder. It's saying you actually have to have the witnesses. And before they're brought before the church, you have to have the witnesses. And so it becomes this, this very fine line because you can be using gossip to destroy a church by whispering behind the scenes. But at the same time, if there's real sin there, it needs to be exposed. And so, again, the thing that, that caps all of it is, are you loving towards the person who you have an accusation against? Are you loving towards the the, the church, I mean, where where is love in this matter so that you can try to evaluate it in your fallen nature? You can try to evaluate it honestly and accurately, but just to go, well, it's about an elder. I can't say anything. Well, then you can never get rid of a bad elder. You can never get rid of an elder who's sinning, and that's, that's not the point of the passage. Right. I mean, we've talked about this before that Scripture talks about and calls the church the ecclesia, and the word for that is like a, like a legislative body. And, I mean, one of the reasons why people don't think they have these responsibilities is because, I mean, if you think of the church as, like, the Senate and each member in the church being, like, a senator, that they have they have real responsibility. They're not the lord of the whole Senate, and yet at the same time, each of them has some responsibility for the well-being of it. It puts a, it puts a, a pressure on them. To, there's times where you cannot be silent. There's times where you absolutely must not speak, and they can be complex. But in the end, it puts a weight of responsibility on you that you have both authority and obligation. And you can't just go, I'm not going to ever do anything. That's not that, that does not satisfy our Lord. And I mean, you go to 1 Corinthians 14, 34, where it says women stay silent in church, that they're asked their husband at home. The clear implication in there is that men are supposed to speak. And when you hear something wrong, you have a duty to speak and not just to go, well, he said heresy. You have a duty to actually go, why do you say this? What's your scriptural basis? Or I think you're wrong here. And too often we just kind of let errors go because nobody wants to say anything. And, and we really have an obligation to speak. And it's easy to talk about speaking about personal things. We also have to speak about the scriptures and the truth of the scriptures because that's what makes the church strong. Is I mean, it's the pillar and ground of the truth. It's when it's standing on truth. That's what makes the church strong. I mean, and, and we you made me think specifically of that verse about women should ask questions at home. Wives have a tremendous power to either harm their husbands or benefit him greatly. There are men who have been worked up by their wives whispering evil things in their ears. There have been... I have been blessed so many times by my wife giving me wise cautions about people, yeah, asking me, why, why doesn't that bother you? Why, why are you overlooking that? You know what I mean? And, and, asking, and she's genuinely asking me to explain it to her and my inability to explain it to her. And she's like, you've said this is a problem, and now here this all of a sudden is not a problem. Can you help me understand why this isn't a You know what I mean? And... I mean, wives can be a tremendous benefit to their husbands 
because there are times where we are not being aware of what we need to be doing. We're not cognizant of the fact that we're being hypocritical. We're being, we're deceiving ourselves and they can cause us to snap out of that and to do the work that, you know, to do our duty and to stand up and be a man sometimes just so we don't lose the respect of our wife, you know what I mean? And which is, which is wrong because it should be for the, for the glory of God and you know, right. for what he's called us to do. But a wife can be a tremendous blessing or a tremendous curse. And so, you know, when we, when we look at this and we talk about gossip, it's really important to recognize that you can go off on either side. On the one side, you can go, I want to say this because I want people to hear it. I want people to know. And on the other side, you can say, I'm glad I don't have to say anything. It would be gossip, so I'll just let the sin continue. And the Bible forces us to take that the position in between there. It forces us to say, okay, so this is darkness. This is sin. How do I deal with it? What's the right way to deal with it? I can't just close my eyes and ignore it, but it doesn't mean I go and tell everybody and try to, and it doesn't mean, right? And so it's it's walking that line between where you go, okay, I'm damaging people for the sake of damaging. I'm speaking just because I want to be puffed up. I want these other things, or I'm just going to close my eyes. We have to be walking between those two. Yeah, you know, we've talked a lot about gossip and we've always, we've so far in this episode, we've been talking about it from the perspective of the gossip the person of what should you say? When shouldn't you say? But God also makes it a crystal clear that gossip is a twofold endeavor. There's the person who's gossiping and the person who's listening. And we need to be a lot more aggressive about not listening to gossip either. And recognize the deceit, recognize, hey, you need to do something about this. You need to know this. When you should go, if it's not your responsibility, no, go talk to the right person. Why are you telling me this about their child? Why don't you go talk to them? Why are you telling me about this problem that you have with this person? Have you talked to them yet? That should be like the standard response when somebody wants to tell us something negative about something. Somebody local, right? Different than Benny Hinn where you don't have the opportunity. But if somebody in the church is going, oh, this person did such and such, you go, why are you talking to me? Have you confronted them in their sin? Have you talked about it? Why do I need to be involved? And, you know, Proverbs 26, 20 through 22 says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a tail bearer are tasty trifles and they go down into the inmost body. We have to recognize we're the wood in that case. The gossip is the person who's throwing the sparks out. The gossip's the person who's trying to light it on fire. The gossip who's try- is the person who's trying to get the tasty trifles to go into the inmost part. But we need to not be wood. We need to not be going, I'm going to listen to this and think that's not sin as well. That is also sin. If it's something that you can't act on, all the same things. If it's something, if you're the wrong person, if you are listening not out of love and to be a blessing to the person, but to know more. If you're doing all those same things that make it salt water for the speaker, it's also salt water for the hearer. I mean, wood is an inanimate object, and there's this part of it where, so if you act like something that has no responsibility, but to let the words have their effect on you, that's how you become wood, right? I mean, you just set, because in the end, words have power, and don't deceive yourself. You can hear things that you cannot unhear. You can hear things that are true that you don't need to know. And then there are other times where you can hear things, you can refuse to hear things that you need to hear. And in both cases, those words can have abs- can have power that can cause incredible damage. There are people in the church who have done sins in their past that you never need to know about. There, I mean, there are sins that are mm-hmm. forgiven by God that you are not in a position to deal with, and that if you hear about them, it will cause you great difficulty in the future. There are sins that are being committed right now in your church that you may have an obligation to know about that you want to close your eyes to. And I mean, and, and Wood just sits there and says, the words are going to follow me, and I'll let them do their work. And, and that is not the place of Wood. And I'll get all burned up about it. Yeah. In the Church of Jesus Christ, people can tr- constrain their tongue. They keep it bridled. In the synagogue of Satan, it's a house of gossip. What do you attend? Thanks for joining us. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching.